Welcome to Valley View, everybody. Hope you're having a good morning. If you would please stand with us in worship. Again, to Valley View, whether you're online or you're here with us this morning, this is where you're meant to be. I want to invite you just to sit for a moment. We're going to just give you your announcements before we release you to greet one another. Um, the hamburger cook-off is today after church. Uh, 
you don't worry, you're not required to cook if you didn't plan on cooking. We have that all set. Everything will be ready to go. Um, if, you're, if you're participating, remember you'll pay $5 and that will give you five quarters of a burger. Uh, and then there's some other uh, items there as well. And um, so if you weren't planning on doing that or if you were, welcome. I think we'll have enough for you to stay afterwards. Uh, so plan on doing that. And we're kind of using that, the funds that we're, that we're selling the, the, your, your tickets for. Uh, we'll go for, uh, I believe, Youth and Children Fundraiser. Um, yeah, our first official full Wednesday back with children and teen activities and uh, adult uh, classes. That is this coming Wednesday. You may have come and enjoy ice cream uh, last Wednesday. I, I can't say there will be no ice cream uh, this Wednesday. I can just say that there, there won't be necessarily uh, only ice cream. <laughs> So please come and discover whether or not there's ice cream on Wednesday. But um, that starts at 6 with the meal, and then we'll go into uh, the other activities around 7. And then, oh, also, yeah, and also another fun thing we're doing on Wednesday is the blood drive. You're thinking, oh, man, how can I serve my community? There's going to be a little uh, trailer in our parking lot. They're going to come by. If you don't give blood or haven't given blood recently, um, this would be a chance for you just to come and support our community. They were asking for at least 12 people to sign up. Um, if you need help figuring out how to do that, uh, I believe there's been like at least six and maybe it's not all of them at our church. Some people just drive by and show up. Certainly if you didn't sign up and you just came and were like, hey, can I give blood? I guarantee you that would be a yes. But they're asking for people to sign up. And I believe what they're excited about is you may win a vacation somewhere. I, I don't remember the details, but you could win a vacation for giving blood. Who wouldn't want to get a free vacation and help your community? So just consider doing that on Wednesday as well. They're going to be doing that between 4 and 7, I believe. And so um, if you just come on out during the regular time and just plan on doing that, I'll give you permission to step out of your class or something and go do that. You have that in advance. The very last thing is just really quickly, membership class. If you're not a member of the church or if you're curious about what does membership mean, um, or maybe you've been a member for a while, you say, you know, I just can't remember what we talked about. If you, any of that sounds interesting to you or in any of those circumstances what you would say is, is yours, uh, we're going to have membership class during the Sunday school hour, so 945 in this room that's straight through these doors that way. And uh, if you need to come see me and, and, and ask any other questions, you can definitely do that. But I think that's our last announcement. So I um, would like to just invite you to stand and greet one another, and then we'll be back to worship.
Okay, let's bring it back together. I want to just call us back together and kind of do our call to worship this morning with a reading from Psalm. Oh, wrong place. I think I have the right device now. Here it is. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for my soul waits. O Israel, I hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. We thank you that your love is abundant. We're thankful that you can hear us and you're present with us. And Lord, we just wait upon you. We put our hope and our trust in you. And we ask that you would reveal yourself to us and that we would be transformed by your goodness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand again as we go back to worshiping in, in song. generation falling down and worship sing the song of ages to the Lamb all have gone before us all who will believe sing the song of ages to the Lamb your name is the highest
we're God. We don't, aren't we glad we don't have a God like that? Right? It works sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. We don't have a God like that. We have a God that is never changing. He's the same always. Thank goodness he is. We want to know that God, he knows all of our problems, all of our worries. If there's something you're carrying with you this morning, we want you to know that this is a place that he can bring it. God is waiting. His arms are wide open, waiting for us to come and to give that to him. During this next song, I will find my way down here. If any of you would like to come and join me, please do. took a breath, you breathed your life in me, you've been so, so kind to me, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God.
thank you for your reckless love for us. Lord, that there's no place that we can wander off or run to you that you're not there. Father, we come to you this morning needing to pray for some of our loved ones. And Lord, we know that when we pray that you are willing and able to heal. So Father, we want to pray for Jerry Cooper this morning. Lord, we lift him up to you. Jerry's kidneys have shut down and things don't look too good, but I was visiting with Susan earlier and he said he had breakfast this morning, so that's that's very good. He has had no appetite, so Lord, we lift him up to you this morning. Father, we also pray for Susan. We know she is struggling with, with walking and she's had a, a procedure done last week on her legs, so Lord, we pray for, for her this morning. Lord, we also pray for our sister Linda Gaskell this morning. We know that she has uh, got some breast cancer and is beginning to, to start treatment with that. So, Father, we pray for her. Lord, we also lift up Betty Golly to you this morning. Father, I just pray for strength for her. Lord, we know she's struggling with some things, some physical things. So, Lord, we pray for her this morning. Father, we also lift our brother Steve Curse up to you. And Lord, we we know that he's went as far as he can go with treatment. So Lord, I lift him up to you this morning. Father, I pray for peace for him and the family. And Lord, I just pray that you will intervene with him in such a way that you will have a comfort with everything that's happening there with that. We also pray for the Ramsey family this morning for the passing of Joseph. Lord, we know that for that and only help there is with that is through you so father we pray you will touch that family today and just let them feel your presence father I also want to pray for a brother tommy sharp today he's around him friday and he does pretty good for a little while but it runs out of air so lord we just pray for breathing and strength for him but lord i just pray you will touch him this morning and lift him up to you and the family I also want to pray for our sister Loretta Martin this morning. We know that she has memory problems, but Lord, she seems to be doing well. So Father, we pray for her this morning. Lord, I also want to lift up Jerry and, and his wife this morning, Jerry Immel, this morning, uh, for healing for both of them. Uh, Father, what a testimony of your healing powers. Uh, we know Bobby is, is struggling with some back pains, so Lord, we just pray for we also pray for Sylvia this morning that is uh, struggling with that breast cancer. Father, we want to list up Joyce Hinderlider to you this morning. Um, I was visiting with her earlier and she's going to the kidney doctor this week. So Lord, we pray for a good report for her. And we also lift up our brother John Kelly this morning for memory. Father, we pray every, every week for healing. stand in anticipation of your healing powers for each of these prayers that we pray. And we know there's never a prayer prayed that's not heard and acted on. Your reckless love you have for us, Lord. So, Father, we thank you. Father, we also want to pray for Pastor Gavin this morning as he brings a message this morning. Holy Spirit, I pray you will move in this place this morning. Let us be changed. Thank you. It's in your name we ask this. Amen. Well, amen. As we uh, prepare to go to the word of the Lord this morning, let's go ahead and affirm our faith with the recitation of the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church of Jesus Christ, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning we're going to be talking about uh, imitating God. And uh, there are notes in there, I believe. Uh, they should be up and ready to go uh, in the app if you're used to following along with that. Um, and and uh, as we were, as I was thinking about this, I kind of smiled because um, what, what's like when you get two kids together and they're together for a while, you might hear a few things, but eventually what you're going to hear, I'm talking about like small kids, you know, um, you're going to hear like, stop copying me, right? That's the big one. I don't know why but that's always such a big deal for kids. They're doing what I'm doing, and they, they fight over that. I don't necessarily understand it, but that's something that happens. Stop copying me. And I, but I, I started thinking about that with um, how we do end up taking on aspects or characteristics of the people that we're around. And so our, our language kind of changes and things. And so I know that when, when my high school friends, I think our favorite word that we used to say all the time was sweet. That's sweet. We used to say that all the time. That's sweet. And then I, I noticed when I got to college uh, years later, people kind of laughed at that. Like they weren't used to hearing that sweet all the time. It was a different group. They had their own lingo. And I'm not sure what I, what I said then when I was excited about something. But I just remember feeling weird about that. And then my mind also raced away to um, being in, in Congo and having taken a three-year-old little boy there with me when we went, and uh, this boy started doing funny things uh, that we noticed what other people did. He was imitating his surroundings, and so one of the things that he would do is a yes was always just this simple thing. There was, there was no verbal yes, uh, not usually, but a yes was just simply, did you catch that? Just, just simply, just this eye raise. And I remember uh, one time he, he had gotten into an accident at school and bumped his head in such a way that he needed stitches in his ear. And, and they, they were like, there's no way we can do this without putting him asleep. So they put him asleep. They give him four stitches, six stitches, something like that in his ear. And he's waking up, and he's a total zombie as he's waking up. His eyes are open, but nobody's home. You know what I mean? And... I knew he was okay finally when I said, hey, can you hear me? Are you doing okay? And I just got this back from him. Yes, everything's good. And, and it just occurs to me that whether we're children and we're kind of upset that people are mocking us or copying us or doing what we're doing, we want to be unique or something, but, but really more in a sense of we kind of take on the characteristics, the personality, the, the words, the phrases, the actions of people who are around us. And if we're going to do that, hopefully we would be doing that in the right way. We don't want to imitate things of the world. We want to imitate things of the kingdom of heaven. We don't want to imitate sinfulness. We want to imitate holiness. We want to resemble our heavenly father, Jesus Christ. So our big idea for today is in this world where old things are passing away, and God's new plan is taking hold, we are called to be imitators of God. So in your faith and life, you are meant to imitate God. And this is not the same as being, this is not to say that we are the same as God, or we are on the same plane as God. This is just to say we want to be like Him, we want to imitate Him in the things that He does, we want to be about those things as well. We're meant to resemble Him. And his love for the world should be, our, our text will say, his love for the world should be evident in our lives. The way that we live, the way that we treat others, the things that we care about, how we spend our time, what we do for fun, how we live, all those things should be a testimony to the fact that there is a God in heaven who loves this world. And we ought to be imitators of that in such a way that, that spills forward through us. So again, your big idea, if you're following along, uh, in this world where old things are passing away, God's new plan is taking hold. We are called to be imitators of God. Let's embrace these new things. And it's not a rejection of our history, of our heritage. We're not saying we can't remember where we come from. What we're saying is that God is doing a new thing in this world, and that involves the world being loved through his people. So with that said, let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. 
um, will be the end of 4 up through the first two verses in chapter 5. So then, putting away falsehood, let each of you speak truth, uh, speak the the truth. Let me start. Let me just start over. Chapter 4, verse 25. So then, putting away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with your neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not make room for the devil. For those who steal must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor, doing good work with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is good for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant uh, fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Amen. This is um, this is a text that I don't necessarily read often enough, but it kind of goes with um, the one that that I was that I brought before you a few weeks ago. Um, so in Ephesians, Paul is explaining this this change uh, to those who who are wondering, okay, so we're becoming Christians. What does that mean for us now? Who, who are we to be? What are we to do? What, okay, so I've accepted your God. I've accepted this message you've given me, and I, and, and, and I want Jesus to be my Savior. So what does that mean? And he's been explaining that. And, and the part that I read to you before, I think it was in chapter 2 uh, a few weeks ago, Paul was saying, hey, you, are, you have a guarantee of your salvation, and the order of the world is this, that you would be Um, that you would receive God's grace and you would turn around and be givers of God's grace. And that's evident in what we're talking about this morning as well. We were once alienated from God. The law couldn't save us. We were unholy. We were doomed. And now, Paul says, throughout Ephesians, that Jesus has redeemed us. He has paid the price. He has made us able to be in God's own presence. So if we are restored into a right relationship with the Father, what's the purpose? What do we do now? You know, we have, we have kind of those jokes that we say, like, the longer a couple is together, the more that they start to look alike. Have you heard those jokes? I even one time, this was a completely different text. I looked it up just because I was curious. But I remember one time I put some pictures up on the screen of people who look like their dogs. Do you remember that? <laughs> and and I, I said, I can't do that again. That was, that was a one, you know, once in a decade thing. But um, the, the truth is, that the more you spend time with a group or the individual, a spouse or a, a close friend or something, the more you kind of start to do things together. That's why often when, when you see a group of kids, you can tell almost that they're together by their things that they say or how they dress. And this, unfortunately, sometimes at schools will lead to like the little groups and hey, this is our group. You're not a part of that based on how you look and things like that. But truthfully, we rub off on one another. And the hope is that as a community of faith who meets together regularly for worship and fellowship and to serve the world together, as we do that, we begin to kind of take on the best characteristics of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So what now? What, is it, what, is, what does that look like? Um, here we go. We're going to start with breaking some of, the, some of this down from Ephesians chapter 4 and just a little bit into chapter 5. But being one with God redeemed or saved or justified or however the Bible might put it, however it might be described, doesn't equal an automatic personality or practice change. Wouldn't it be great if you heard the gospel message, you prayed at the altar, you prayed at your chair, you prayed in your small group, wherever you were, you prayed and automatically you were a holy, sanctified, perfect saint in the world, able to go out and represent God perfectly in every way. That would be fantastic. And there are probably some people in here who have an experience similar to that where their life was drastically changed. But still, even in those drastic changes, there are, there are steps we have to take. We have to carry on this transformation because just because my heart is convinced I need Jesus doesn't mean my will is convinced. 
It doesn't mean that automatically I do all the right things and say all the right things. And not that we have to be perfect instantly, but the idea is we are meant to imitate God. God doesn't do sinful stuff. God doesn't do hateful things. And if we're going to look like God, we have to stop doing hateful things. We have to be people, for example, who forgive others. Oh man, I hate forgiving people. Well, guess what? You're meant to imitate God who forgave you in your sin. How can you not be somebody who forgives other people? Ooh. I have to forgive people. So, I would say that um, we, we've seen people who've been at the altar time and time again in our lives, and maybe we were those people. We came to the altar, we gave our lives to Christ, we recommitted ourselves over and over again. Because although, our, although in our heart we said, I recognize I need Jesus, maybe there were parts of us that never really were transformed. And those things come, uh, well, let me just give you this blank here if you're following along. Uh, so being one with God, imitating God, being complete in our holiness, which holiness is a scary word, but uh, just means some of these things, being like God. Uh, that requires the development of a Christ-like character through spiritual disciplines, disciplines, through grace. We can't do it ourselves just because we want to, but through God's grace uh, coming to us. But also, most importantly, through time. Usually we need time. And there's a, an old debate in, in the Church of Nazarene about whether when you commit to follow God, if that can happen instantly or whether that takes time. And we're not going to get into that argument because just practically, I'm telling you, it's both. You can have an instant transformation where something changed for you right away, but also other things take time. I need to develop spiritual disciplines in my life that help form me and transform me and remake me and mold me and shape me so that I look more and more like God over time. And all of this, even with my own best efforts, is not possible by myself, so I also need grace, mercy that God would give me so that I can... Uh, so that I can become what he wants me to become, so I can imitate him. <laughs> I think about, um, I mentioned one child, I'll mention another child. When my first child was born, uh, I kind of recognized, oh man, I am a dad now. And I remember the very first time I was called dad, the doctor said, hey, uh, dad, step a couple, make a couple steps over here because I need to do something. And it was still uh, just in the moments that... Uh, that Macy was born. And I remember thinking, how'd she know, you know, like I'm a dad now. And it wasn't not when she was pregnant. It's not uh, when, when the baby was on its way and we we're at the hospital. It's when the doctor said, dad, take a few steps over here for me and, and do this now. I realized I'm a dad. In that moment, I became a dad. That's true. I was a dad. And yet, a sense of mystery and fear and wonder and dread and excitement and love and joy and peace and unrest and all these mixed emotions flooded me in that time. And I said, oh boy, I am a dad. And, and even if I was fully a dad at that moment, I didn't know what it meant to be a dad. And it was going to take me some time to fully recognize what that means and what it means in my life. And obviously you can experience this without having children, but it was this moment of something new, being a part of something, and then saying, yeah, that's who I am, but then realizing, oh, I, I need to learn patience. I need to learn lack of sleep or whatever it is, and obviously that evolves. And I would hope that in our lives, as we, as we give portions of our life to the Lord, as we come closer to Him and we continue to throw out the old things and take on the new things that God is doing in us and through us, that we, as we try to look more like Him, that uh, we would just do this as a process every day and not say, well, I was saved five years ago, 15 years ago, 50 years ago. But then we would say, I was saved in that time and God is still good to me. God is still working on me. I've arrived as a father now, just so you know. I, I'm 100% good father now. So... Um, this text tells us several things about, about Christ-likeness then. Um, okay, so we're, we're, we know that we have to do this regularly. 
We know that we can start it, but it's not completed necessarily, so we have to work for that. It takes grace, and it takes time uh, through spiritual disciplines. Uh, all of that can build up in us. But um, So what are the aspects? So there's, I would say there's three. There's a belief side, there's a practice side, and there's a worship side, or a, a will side. And, and probably there's more. Someone else might describe these differently. But we have to believe or ha- or uh we have a belief in the goodness of God and his saving grace. And that's usually the thing that comes around right away. We can believe. And even those who struggle with, I don't understand how God created the world in seven days. Or I don't understand how, uh, you know, this miracle happened or that miracle happened. Even if there's a doubt in us, very often we can still say, okay, I believe that there is a God. And I believe that he uh, He has a, a plan to save me, and Jesus Christ is part of that plan. Usually that's kind of the first step for us. And, and then we start to work on the practices, right? Okay, so if I'm a Christian now, what are some Christian things I should do? I should make sure I, I, I go to church. I should make sure I read my Bible. Probably ought to start praying. Ooh, there's probably some things in my life that I need to stop doing as well. And so we start saying, okay, these are things that I'm adding, and these are things I'm, I'm putting aside. But this text doesn't necessarily just give us those things we should stop doing or things we should start doing. It says that, essentially, in summary, we need to be practicing loving relationships with God and others. And as a part of those loving relationships, some of these things you're going to start doing, some of these things you're going to stop doing. And so falsehood, then, is replaced by truth. Don't be false anymore. That's one of the practices you could do. Maybe you have a temptation to lie. Maybe you have a temptation to cheat on things. Maybe you have a temptation to even fill your taxes out in a way that maybe isn't so honest, but you get what you need. Maybe, maybe you're just dishonest with your relationships and, and aren't truthful. So replace that with truthful practices because when we tell the truth and we are honest, upright people, we actually show love to the people around us. Wouldn't it be weird if we worshiped a God who lied to us, who manipulated us, who hurt us, so we have a God who, who honors truth and who models truth for us, and that's how we're going to imitate him. Also, anger should not be allowed to produce fruit, but it should be dealt with. It doesn't say don't ever be angry. It says in your anger, don't allow yourself to sin, and then it says don't let the sun go down on your anger. What this means is you actually need to deal with it. If you get upset with someone, if you're angry at someone, you need to speak to them. You don't come and say, these are all the things you did wrong, because it's possible that you did something wrong too. But you need to deal with that. Don't let the anger just stew in you, because how, when you are angry with someone, how are you supposed to show them love and grace and kindness in the way that God shows us love and grace and kindness? How can you do that if you're mad at them? You might wonder, how can God love me? Isn't he angry with the bad things in my life, my failures, my weaknesses, my trials, my temptations? Yeah, he is. Until Jesus Christ is your Lord, then he's not mad at you anymore. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I, re- I talk about it all the time. It's my favorite passage. We were once enemies of God, but in Christ Jesus we have become friends of God. He's not mad at us anymore. We can be in his presence. So in, in the same way, replace dishonest work with honest work. We should be careful with our words and be sure to show kindness with them. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. False, right? We might say that, but the things people say really do hurt us. And it's so easy to break somebody down and to, and to hurt them with just simple things that we say. So we have to guard our words. We have to be sure that our words project a belief that if God is gentle with me and forgiving of me and loving of me, then the words that I speak to people who believe differently from me, to people who vote differently than I do, to people who look differently and are strange to me, people who I don't agree with things that they're doing, I have to make sure that grace and love pours out of my mouth. It does not mean we can't ever be a part of calling people towards repentance. We can be a part of that. But to do so with love and kindness in the way that God is loving and kind to us, I hope that makes sense for you. So above all, we have to imitate God as children do. Stop copying me. We want, we want God to be like, wow, look at those kids copying me. 
we want God to be looking down at us and say, oh, look, he's doing the things that I'm doing. He's got the eye raised down, right? We want God to look down at us and say, wow, look at my children. They're imitating me. And, and this, is, this is, there's no better way in my mind of explaining how this works. When we first come to faith in God, we're like children who obey our parents because we don't want to get in trouble. You've probably heard me say this before. So, so we obey God because we don't want to go to hell. We say accept Christ because we're scared that one day we could be in a bad place, so we accept Christ today. And yet eventually we start, hopefully we start developing some of these disciplines over time and God's grace to us. And, and we start developing some of these disciplines and we say, okay, great. Now that I'm following God and doing these things, we, we learn a little bit. But it's like when we're saying, okay, I'm going to obey mom and dad. I don't want to get in trouble, but also I can anticipate. I know the rules, right? I know no TV after this time, or I know that I have to get my homework done before I go relax or play. <coughs> I got to take out the trash, and so we start doing those different things that we know we're supposed to do because we know our role. But eventually, hopefully, we get to the place where we anticipate what God wants. We anticipate as kids what our parents want, and even if the parents didn't say, go do this, go do that, and give us direct order, we just kind of do it. Hopefully, we get there because we love our parents. And eventually, our heart says, I love my parents. I'm going to do what makes them happy, what makes them proud, and what honors them. So finally then, uh, so we have the belief and the practice, and we get to our will. Conforming our will to that of the Father is kind of that last aspect of transformation. It comes last. Because even if my, I think my heart is in the right place, I still have this desire to be me, to do what I want. And that will comes over time. So with our will is where we finally hand it all over. We recognize that it's not God in charge, but uh, it's not us in charge, but it is God in charge. And I think of the story of the rich young ruler from Luke chapter 18. You know this story, probably. Jesus is on the road, he's walking, and his disciples are with him and people around, and probably he's like a little bit of a celebrity. We know that um, earlier on in his ministry he couldn't get away. There's always people chasing him down and following him, and he's trying to get away all the time, and He's like, you're just chasing the miracles or whatever it is. But he's kind of a popular guy. And as he's walking, there's probably, hey, that's Jesus. Like, I've never been someplace for maybe one time where I saw someone famous. And there's certainly there was a buzz in the room. Do you see that person? He's there. They're here. And I remember even when some, you know, there was some show was being filmed in, um, in, in the area. And it was like, Tim McGraw and Faith Hill are in town. And people were like, oh, my goodness. They're in town. And there was a but people didn't even see them or know where they were, but they were excited because they were in town. And I imagine as Jesus is walking, there's a little bit of that buzz as he goes through a village to village or place to place on his trip. People are like, hey, that's the Jesus guy. And so one such person who kind of gets excited about this is he doesn't have a name, he's just the rich ruler or the rich young ruler, is how he's described. He comes to Jesus and says, Hey Jesus, expecting that Jesus would know he's somebody important, he could tell. And wanting to probably just receive a little bit of accolades and, and well wishes from Jesus. He's like, hey, Jesus, what should somebody do if they want to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus is like, well, you know the commandments. And he begins to list them. These are the commandments you should do. And before Jesus can finish listing them, the rich young ruler is like, yeah, 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 Jesus, I got those down. I'm good at all the commandments. You know that uh, I do those. And Jesus is like, oh, I'm so happy for you. You got the commandments down. In other words, I, I kind of see this. You got the you got the will, or you got the heart down. You believe. You've got the practice down. You're you're doing what you're supposed to do. But now, what you need to do is you need to sell everything you own. Just one little thing. Just sell everything that you own. Give that money to the poor, and then the important part: come follow me. The disciples are kind of stressed by this. How could we've given everything up to follow you? How is this possible? Because, well, Jesus, just like you know. It's easier for a rich person to go through the eye of a needle than a camel go through the eye of a needle. Man, I'm, 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 I'm trying to tell the story quickly and I mess that up. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And there's a lot of commentary on what exactly does that mean? Was this a gate into Jerusalem? Was this really an eye of a needle? What's important to know is that this was a hard thing. And it was in a language they would have understood as being nearly impossible. Because then the disciples get upset and they say, Jesus, we've given up everything for you. 
we've done everything. How is it not possible for people to go to heaven after giving up everything? And Jesus says, don't worry. What's impossible with man is possible with God. And that's kind of the end of the story. You see, right away we start to evaluate, well, am I a rich person or not a rich person? I mean, like, compared to who am I rich? Like, are we comparing ourselves to, like, you know, some of, you know, uh, Elon Musk? Are we comparing ourselves to, like, a, like, a regular person? Or how do I decide if I'm rich? Well, here's the thing. This rich young ruler was all about his life. He was busy with the power. He was busy with the, the, the land and the business part of what he, what he was involved in. It's not like his money was just sitting in a bank and he sat there and he took his dividends and he was happy. No, he, he had a business of being a wealthy, powerful person. He ruled because of his wealth and his power. And so Jesus says, you have to leave that life behind so that you can come and follow me. In other words, you have to make following me the most important thing in your life. And so right away you're saying, I'm not rich. Well, great. There may still be something in your life that keeps you from following Jesus the way that you should. For me in my own life, it's part of my testimony. I know that I, I felt like I was going to be a soccer player first, and then I would follow Christ later. And when I read these words uh, years ago in my dorm room, I, I felt like the Lord said, you can't play soccer and still uh, make it into the kingdom of heaven. For me, at that time, that was something that I had placed in between my relationship with Jesus Christ. I couldn't imitate Jesus anymore because I had this other thing. Or I couldn't imitate, couldn't imitate him as I should. And so I had to give it up. And God did give that back to me in ministry years later. And what I want to encourage you is not to read this or think about this text and say, okay, well, I'm, I'm a pretty nice person. I... Uh, I don't steal stuff. I'm, I'm honest most of the time. I'm, I'm, I'm honest. I'm honest. I'm trustworthy. Um, and I'm not rich, so I don't have anything left to do. I'm convinced that there's always something the Lord is speaking to us about. And if we would be sensitive enough to listen, that we would hear what the Lord wants to tell us. Let me invite the worship team to make their way back up. So it's not necessarily about money. It's not necessarily about having a checklist of things that you do and don't do. I would say it's much more seriously, much more readily about recognizing that there's, another, there's something else you can do to imitate Christ more regularly. And for some of us, that might be, yeah, I need, to, I need to pray more. I need to do Sabbath better. I need to expect God to work in my life, but not necessarily seek the miracles of, of the signs and the wonders. Maybe it means that I seek what the Lord is, is doing around me and, and, and wanting to be a part of that. Maybe it does mean giving of my finances more it does mean serving in, in, in my church and in my community more. But I'm certain the Lord would have us, if we all said, oh, I'm, I look exactly like God looks, there's nothing, no difference, that some of us would say, oh, I'm, I'm kind of scared to say that. And I think we can get there more and more each day with God's help over time. So have you looked at your spiritual mirror lately? If you have, what do you see? If you haven't, we're going to go to a time of prayer, and that would be a time to look in the mirror and say, Lord, is there something that's in the way, a burden, a stumbling block, something that's between you and me that makes me not look like I should, that keeps me from imitating you well? And if there is, Lord, I ask you to remove that in this time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we know that you're good. We know that you're loving. We know that you have done so much in us. and We've built up testimonies of, of ways that you've healed us and restored us, the ways that you've redeemed us and given us hope for a future. But Lord, we don't want to fall short. We don't want to be people who resemble the world. Is there a part of us that we haven't given to you? Is it just our will and our desire? Could it be something like in our free time, how we, how we um, relax? Could it be something with our relationships? Lord, will you speak to us? Move in and through us. We trust you. Lord, we want to resemble you more and more each day, so we make this our prayer and our commitment by your help and your time, and we know that you'll be faithful to do it. Amen. Let's stand and close in our final song together. Thank you. 
Extend your hands as you receive the benediction this morning. God of peace, equip us with every good thing for doing your will and for imitating you in the world around us. Work in us that which is pleasing to you through Christ Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.